everybody's got their own theory of what's what's happening, you know, especially with this case. And it being a firefighter and a EMT, I mean, it makes the news. The death of an emergency medical technician in Indiana is called suspicious. People were saying that some drunk or crazy guy from the casino was following her home. Court documents show there were many bruises on her body. The monks, the fire and EMS people around here, you know, people whisper and talk and, and come up with their own theories. And everybody, not just our family, has questions. Half the people are going to be wrong, half of them are going to be right. How are you going to come together as a community after that? Once those rumors and suspicions are out there, they're almost like a bullet. You just can't call them back. comes from a house on a typically quiet street in downtown Lawrenceburg. By the time detectives Barry Bridges and John Vance arrive, it's clear something out of the ordinary is happening. Lawrenceburg first responders were already on scene. It was probably one of the larger crowds I'd ever uh, seen. I observed that there was quite a few firemen there. The reason for the throng of first responders is because the home belongs to two of their own, Bill and Melissa Henderson. Melissa was an EMT, and Bill was a volunteer fireman. Bill Henderson was being consoled by other firefighters. They basically uh, tell me that uh, uh, Mr. Henderson and one of his friends had come home a little bit earlier and found uh, Mrs. Henderson in her bed, uh, deceased. The detectives push through the crowd and make their way to the first floor bedroom. What we observed then is Melissa, you know, crossways across her mattress on the bed, partially uh, covered, wearing a robe, but she was face down. The position of the body didn't seem right. It's not usual for a lady of Melissa's age to just, just die. There wasn't any sickness that she had or anything. There was just no reason for her to be dead. We could see that there was a couple of fingernails that had actually been, you know, snapped or broken off. There close to Melissa, up towards her head, there was some small, what appeared to be droplets of blood. That was significant. I noticed that there looked like there was a anniversary card, a bouquet of flowers up on the chest of drawers, and um, maybe a radio charger and a few things, but nothing really seemed, you know, scattered about. If she needed help, that radio is basically just roll over and grab the radio and you can call for assistance. Unless it's something that causes her to come to, to death that quick, you know, like a heart attack or something of that nature. Uh, she shouldn't be dead, as far as we know, so we need to find out.
This was Melissa, my mom and dad's 25th anniversary. Somebody was probably talking to her, the look on her face, somebody was talking to her and said something. She just looked at him like, you're crazy, kind of. <laughs> she was funny. She was very energetic. Very artistic. <clears throat> very loving. A wonderful mother. A wonderful sister, a wonderful daughter. This is Bill and Melissa on the day of their wedding. Their marriage, they were happy. They were happy and they always laughed and cut up. Yeah, they, they were happy. They were really happy. When I got to the scene, they told us that uh, uh, we had one of our own that had passed away. And, uh, and it was Melissa. My children went to school with her children, and I know that she was a good mom. With firefighters, um, it's all a brotherhood, and you know, uh, try to be there for the husband and uh, be there for him and his family. I just, you know, kind of rubbed his back and just tried to console him, and, and he just kept saying, she's gone, she's gone. According to Bill, he and his friend and co-worker Darren entered the home sometime after 8 p.m. Once inside, they found Melissa's lifeless body in the bedroom. Walked in with my friend and his wife is in bed, unresponsive, unbreathing. She's cold. At some point, you know, we're obviously going to talk to the spouse. We're obviously going to talk to Bill. Just to get his statement to start talking to him, to find out, you know, a timeline for him for the day. At that point, it could have been, you know, almost anything from medical to maybe something nefarious happened here earlier. Well, if you could just basically kind of take us through your day to day. Okay. Aside from volunteering as a firefighter, Bill earns extra spending money working as a general contractor. Bill had made mention that on June 17th, at between 9 and 9.30 a.m. that he was actually on his way out the door. And he was going to go to Northern Kentucky in Boone County and that he had a side gig. My wife pulled up, it was about nine o'clock then. I came out the door, she was coming in the door. I gave her a hug, she gave me a kiss. I told her, well, I gotta get home, get that done, I'll see her later. <laughs> Bill then claims that as he was driving to the job site, he fell ill and had to stop at a gas station. The next thing I know, I woke up, I was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. He's ultimately released that day, and he showed me paperwork where he had been actually admitted to the hospital, and I believe still had his uh, band on from the hospital, uh, identifying it uh, that he had been there. At approximately 5 p.m., Bill is released from the hospital and begins his journey home. As he's driving, Bill calls Darren. Bill and Darren are both volunteer firefighters. Darren was gonna be borrowing Bill's truck. Previously, Bill had agreed to help Darren move, but since he is still less than 100%, the two men agree to meet at Bill's home. And they both kind of get there around about the same time, and Darren actually goes in with Bill to get this set of car keys. I went in, Darren came in behind me, I turned the light on, and I was hollering, bless her, bless her. She didn't answer, she didn't answer. Darren said, damn, she must sleep heavy. She was just laying there. So I went around her like I normally do, I went to shake her, and that's when I felt it was cold. Mm -hmm. So Darren grabbed her hand and felt her pulse, and by then, I don't know, instinct, I went to pick her up like this, when I did, I seen that, I don't know, it was like bloody, and it made a, like a noise. I picked her up, and I, man, I, it freaked me out. I started shaking that. Darren said, Boo, you need to call 911. Darren believed that uh, Bill was possibly in shock at the time and uh, couldn't make the phone call, so Darren actually made that call. After speaking to Bill, detectives sit down with Darren to see if he can corroborate the story they've been told. I guess you, uh, you know Bill, right? And did you know Melissa? Yeah. Really? I knew Bill was very good with Melissa, but I met okay. Melissa pretty well. Uh, how did you get with Bill tonight? 
I'm going to borrow a truck to move boxes from my old place to the new to, place. To the new one? Okay. And he said he was going to Kentucky? Yeah. What time was you supposed to meet with him? Switch trucks? Yeah, we got back. Okay. Basically, what I sense from Darren is Darren wasn't telling me everything. This is a death scene, and for some reason, this guy's acting, you know, like he's holding back on us. One day after Melissa's death, the pathologist performs an autopsy. The autopsy came back as undetermined cause of death. Uh, which sort of baffled us. Just because we don't know cause and manner of death, that doesn't mean we can't we can stop investigating. There's a family out there that wants to know what's going on, and we have to just keep working until we find out what actually happened. Friday, June 22, 2005. Melissa's friends and family gather to say their final goodbyes. The day that we had the funeral, that's the first time I got to see my sister. And I went in and I looked at her and I noticed that something wasn't right. My sister had a um, purple bruise going clear across her, her neck. Everybody in the funeral home, I, I think, were in disbelief. It, it was like, did you see the net? I think in any small town, it's hard to keep secrets. People watch out windows, people watch out doors, people pass by, people are bored. You know, everybody's got their own theory of what's, what's happening, you know, especially with this case. Being a firefighter and an EMT, I mean, it makes the news. It's like wildfire, you know, it spreads. Almost a week after her death, the family of 34-year-old EMT Melissa Henderson gathers to mourn her loss. But before the ceremony begins, the funeral director makes an alarming discovery. I didn't know whether I should say anything or not, but I didn't want to not say something. We were getting her dressed and doing her makeup. I noticed that some excessive bruising around the throat area. The embalming process, uh, that sometimes brings out bruising, makes bruising darker. That kind of hit that there's something to this more than just a natural death. It was very upsetting. I mean, there was no doubt then, no doubt, that someone had strangled her. You could see every finger mark. A second autopsy is ordered using a different pathologist. This time, the cause of death is ruled as strangulation. Melissa Henderson was murdered. Was there any reason that I would think that somebody would harm my sister? Or if I think that she would have, uh, that something, somebody had it out for her? My sister had no enemies whatsoever. In a suspicious death, you basically want to do some victimology. You need to find out as much as you possibly can about the decedent. To learn more about their victim, detectives ask Melissa's husband, Bill, to speak with them again. While we were talking to Bill early on, I believe he even made reference to the fact that we were kind of like the Brady Bunch. Everything was great. We all got along, and uh, there was no rifts in the family. Bill Henderson, he was really respected. He was a great family man, great father, and a great husband. He provided very well for his family and made sure that they always had what they needed. Along with probing into his and Melissa's marriage, detectives need Bill to retell his story of being out of town. 
He had told us that he actually did make a, a phone call uh, when he was on his way back from Berea, Kentucky. And what we did was we verified that with his answering service at the time. Friday, 6 6 p.m. Additional questions about Bill's story are set aside when surveillance footage from a local gas station confirms his morning departure. I was able to actually see Bill's vehicle leaving the home, which meant, hey, well, you know, he's telling the truth. While the official investigation grinds ahead, Melissa Henderson's friends and co-workers start to talk. The casino is about 20 minutes from Lawrenceburg. And her job at the casino was an EMT. She was an EMT, I think, mostly at nights there. Once the casino came in, uh, everything started changing uh, from small town to uh, there's money everywhere. There's you know, random people, a lot of people out of towners, never been there. People were saying that some drunk or crazy guy from the casino was following her home. Melissa told me a few times she was being followed and stalked and, and that type of thing. I tried to get her to go to the police and, you know, report something, but she she wouldn't do it. So it's typical in a case like this, investigators are going to go around, start canvassing the area, and they'll start inside and just work their way out and talk to as many people as they can, people who know the Henderson family the goings, the comings, and things like that. But above all else, the dig for information reveals that not everyone in Lawrenceburg is willing to talk. Situations like this case, where you have two people that were members of a fire department, one EMS, one on the fire department side, it's a family. So when one of theirs has a problem or whatever, the rest of them gather around and support them. They're your brothers and sisters, and you follow them into a house fire, and you trust them with your life, and they trust you with, with their life. It's hard to explain. It's like a family atmosphere, and you don't want to accuse your family of, of doing something horrendous. In early August, the processing of the DNA samples retrieved from the crime scene is complete. The DNA found at the scene contained a mixture of Melissa Henderson and William Henderson. That's not all. There was some DNA that was found that was unknown and couldn't be attributed to either Melissa or William Henderson. Who left that DNA behind? Who's responsible for this? We have to wonder, could that be a person that has done this to Melissa? Yeah, I would say a small town like this, when the rumors goes around about who did what, uh, you know, people get to know it and they talk about it. Melissa was very scared of different relatives in Bill's family. There was just a lot of, a lot of history, a lot of things that made her nervous. She didn't want to be around. She didn't even want her kids around them. There was uh, one guy in Bill's family that she was specifically afraid of. I believe he, it shot somebody when he was younger and like went out broad daylight, shot this guy in the head, walks in, starts drinking a beer and watch TV. Like the guy wasn't right.
Anderton's 12-year-old daughter created this memorial to her mother on the bed where she was found dead by her husband, a volunteer fireman in Lawrenceburg. She didn't go down easy, that she, you know, it wasn't somebody who just died. As time went on and we weren't hearing anything from the police and we didn't know what was going on and it didn't appear like anything was going on, um, I did. I felt like that this could very well end up being a cold case, that it just never was pushed. So you're looking for answers like everybody else? Yes, I'm looking for answers. You know, I'm her spouse. You know, we've been together 16 years, married a little over 14. My daughter's has been asking me what happened to mommy, what happened to mommy. I basically know as about as much as somebody that lives five doors down the street. I know nothing. Uh, what's went on, uh, they just will not uh, comment to me on anything. But you have your ideas about how she died. I mean, you have your suspicions. Yeah, everybody has their suspicions about things. Dearborn County detectives investigating the murder of Melissa Henderson have evidence that has an unknown source of DNA on her body. Could it belong to her killer? We had had a name come up later on, uh, a relative of uh, the Henderson family who actually did have a, a violent past. We spoke to Melissa's family and Someone in the family mentioned that if anybody had harmed Melissa, it was probably a family member of Bill that Melissa had sort of been scared of. And the more and more we dug into this guy, it came to light that he had spent 20 years in prison for actually committing a violent act. He actually shot someone in the head. Locating Bill's relative takes time, but when they do, detectives get the sense he's not their man. He was fairly frail and uh, had some medical uh, complications. He just didn't have the physical presence to actually commit this type of crime. We also obtained a DNA sample from uh, this individual, uh, which was tested and through the testing, he was ruled out. Ruling out one person of interest doesn't change the facts. The DNA suggests that some unidentified person was with Melissa before she died. While trying to figure out who that person can be, detectives uncover another mystery. We were able to locate a couple of the ladies who were out on a porch. They informed me that, you know, they had uh, seen a pickup truck pull up and Melissa get out of it. And after speaking with family members and others, we couldn't identify who that particular person was. Only thing we knew was we needed to find out who did this green chug belong to? Why is it they're coming to her home when no one else who's close to Melissa knows who this is? Melissa and I worked uh, at their casino. It's on the river, on the Ohio River. It has uh, restaurants inside, it has a pavilion. They also have music and, of course, the gambling. The gambling's the big thing. There was rumors at the casino that she, uh, being involved there and being an EMT, that, you know, maybe somebody got a little too attached. Uh, but there was also a lot of rumors because with that many people in one place, there's going to be talk. One day when Melissa and I were working out, she was telling me, that she was being watched and that she was being followed. Every time she turned around, it seemed, seemed like somebody was following her in a vehicle. It was never the same vehicle, neither. It was always a different, a different vehicle. Um, once I remember a truck. It 
it did come out that her supervisor, uh, James, in fact, picked her up or dropped her off from time to time. James is actually uh, the owner of that green truck. James is now also someone the detectives must pay a visit to. James, before we went on uh, the tape here, you stated to me that uh, you did have a relationship with Melissa. Yes. What was the nature of the relationship? Um, I just want to start at the beginning, I guess. Okay. The idea of a strangulation is someone's obviously very angry and motivated, um, you know, a crime of passion. One of the possible explanations is that James um, was in an affair with her and that she was calling it off um, to be with her husband and that he was angered by this. But he is not the only person with a possible motive. James is a married man. Does his wife know about the affair? James's wife, she would certainly have motive um, to kill Melissa Henderson. Well, I mean, honestly, it's just unbelievable, you know, because when they come through the firehouse uh, with the kids, you just don't think anything, you know, other than a good family there. It seemed like they were both happy here. So, uh, but you never know what happens with families, you know, behind closed doors. You know, some people don't bring stuff like that to work. When she first told me, I, I was shocked. I said, you do realize he's married? And she said, yes. And I said, y you better be careful. James was a nice looking man, very good looking man. And uh, he was very well dressed because he worked the table games and they wore suits. At first, Melissa Henderson's boss, James Grunfeld, remained quiet about their secret relationship. But when detectives investigating her murder confront him, he starts talking. He told me that he and Melissa had been uh, dating. They had known each other in the past. And had, when she started working at the casino, they rekindled a relationship. James claims that in the weeks just prior to her death, he and Melissa had regularly been meeting up. We met on several occasions outside of work, you know, and we text each other an awful lot. We okay. could be talk on the cell. During the conversation, James reveals that the last time he saw Melissa was the day before her murder. She says, you know, look, I'd like to see you for a little bit if I can. Okay. I said, uh, you know, what time or what do you want to do? That was Thursday, somewhere around 1, 1 1.30 p.m. So we agreed to meet at, must have been 1.20 because it seemed like I said, we'll meet at 2.20, she told me to be on time because I'm always late. At that point, there's somebody else who's obviously uh, in the mix when it comes to this investigation. Naturally, we are going to uh, take this person's DNA and compare that with anything we find at the scene, just as we would with anybody else's. James claims that he and Melissa parted ways that day on good terms, and that on the day Melissa is killed, he was home with his wife. You know, if she knows about this affair going on, then, you know, that's a woman scorned, you know? That could also be motive. According to James, his wife had no idea the affair took place. James does tell us that he actually told his wife the following day, being the day after Melissa's death. Now, uh, it made sense that he would do so because once the police get involved, once they start investigating, he didn't want us knocking on his door without his wife knowing. 
Is this an attempt to deflect attention away from his wife? To find out, detectives arranged to speak to her directly. His wife confirms that James was home with her the morning of Melissa's death and that they had coffee together that morning. And at some point thereafter, he popped out uh, briefly to go and pick up a splitter for a cable splitter for the television, I believe, from a local hardware store and come right back. That means there is an hour that morning where James is unaccounted for. Obviously, it, it made sense there, that the motive would be there for James to kill Melissa if Melissa wanted to end her relationship with Bill and, and wanted James to tell his wife. Detective Vance actually went to the hardware store. He found the receipt, got, uh, basically found out what he had purchased and uh, ran his timeline. It seemed to it make sense. So his alibi checked out. But detectives still have the DNA found on Melissa's body. As the investigation proceeded, we were able to determine that James had spent some time with Melissa the night before her murder. So we expected that that would be a possibility that we would find his DNA. But his DNA did not match. out both James and his wife as suspects does something else. It turns the investigators' glare on the other side of Melissa's affair. Did her husband Bill or his firefighter friend Darren know? Initially, speaking with Darren, uh, he was hesitant. You could tell he was holding something back. Wasn't sure if Darren was holding back because he knew what had happened whether he was there when it happened and seen it happen, or if he had done it. Hearing that, hey, you're suspect in this, I think kind of gave him pause. This time, when they speak to Darren, he decides to talk. Darren did divulge that he was helping Bill track down his wife and spy on his wife, and that she, he believed she was actually having, you know, an, an extramarital affair, which they seemed to approve it. And at that point, now we're thinking, well, okay, well, you know, this is the motive that's as old as time. With the focus now back on Bill, detectives are contacted by a local reporter. I was made aware by a local uh, television reporter, Deb Dixon, that she was doing a story, a follow-up story on Melissa's death. She told me, John, you've got to see this. And at that point, she shows me a clip of the interview she did with Bill me and my wife, we were like the uh, Brady Bunch with all the kid, without all the kids. Uh, we've been together 16 years. Some friends of mine, they, they called me and, and asked me about it and asked me if I really, really believed it at first. And nobody believed it at first. My reaction, it was just unbelievable. I mean, uh, I didn't know, I didn't know what to think. I mean, I just didn't. You know, we're supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. And then all of a sudden you're, you're hit with this.
me and my wife, we were like the uh, Brady Bunch with all the kid, without all the kids. Uh, we've been together 16 years. Uh, we met in '89. We got married in, uh, June 15th of '91. Uh, everybody that knew us in the community, friends, family, uh, that knew us, we got along. We were a, we were a good couple. Bill was trying to describe the perfect family. You know, everything's as good as it can be when we already knew things weren't weren't good. From the onset of the investigation, he never made reference to anything being wrong in the marriage whatsoever. But as I watched the video, Bill's story seemed to change. In a part of an interview that never aired, Bill Henderson reveals that in fact he was suspicious of Melissa. You never um, never confronted her in any way, never talked yes, about we, it? Yes, we've talked about it probably a couple weeks before this. Uh, talked about her having an affair? No, not having an affair. She were she would be leaving the home earlier uh, in the afternoon saying she's going to a friend's house. He just kept saying she's going to this friend's house and it was like every day, every day, every day. And I just asked her, I said, you know, is there something else going on besides this? And she said no. Uh, and then we pretty well left it at that. The truth is the truth. If you're telling the truth, your story shouldn't change. You know, thing, you know, we know from our investigation, from what you've told us also, that you was upset. You found out she'd been messing around on you. I had a suspicion, I told you guys. I didn't say she was. I had a suspicion that she was. I just kept calling him out on inconsistent statements, what made sense, what didn't make sense. But you told other people you knew I had a knew. suspicion. No, I didn't say I knew. I had a suspicion. It's what I thought. You told Dad Dixon that you didn't know that we told you that. We didn't tell you that. Yeah, you did. As Bill continues to deny knowing about the affair, detectives work to catch him in another lie. Who, who else has a motive to kill Melissa? I don't know. Exactly. And I can't find anybody. And everybody's pointing to this James guy and saying, oh, well, you know, why, what's his motive to kill her? Somebody strangled her. And everything's See, pointing to you, Bill. She was alive when I left. Very, she went to the door, and I went out the front door and said, I'll see you at three. That's true. Now, Bill. Well, that's, true. yes, it is. Yes, it is. I knew at that point, after talking to him, pointing out those inconsistencies, that uh, William Henderson was not going to take responsibility at that particular time for the death of his wife. So I arrested him right there. Bill's friend Darren is never charged in connection with Melissa's murder. And he goes on to help investigators build their case against Bill. Darren revealed that at the scene when they discovered the body that William Henderson didn't go straight to Melissa to determine if she was alive or what was wrong with her, he went straight to a, d a drawer, pulls the EMT radio out, and places it on um, the counter. So as far as the significance of the radio, it didn't necessarily lead me to believe right then, right there, that, hey, that the, there's something uh, we're not seeing or something nefarious going on or foul play. So because access to emergency services were basically at her fingertips. Bill also makes sure there were anniversary cards on the dresser and a message on their answering machine. All right, love you. Be home a bit. It is all part of an evil plan to build the illusion they were a happily married couple. If he did believe he was smarter than the people investigating him, uh, that was his own miscalculation. Once we found out that he was accused of killing his wife, um, no one really wanted to talk about it. Uh, we didn't know if there was others involved. We, we didn't want to get involved ourselves. How did I react? Hmm. I, I don't know. I just, I was kind of saddened in a way. I didn't think, uh, I thought, wow, it just, it's unbelievable. 
I mean, you know, Bill, I've talked to Bill many times here at this department because he was a volunteer and he, he volunteered a lot. You know, uh, I thought they were a great team here, it seemed like. In July 2007, Bill Henderson stands trial for murdering his wife, Melissa. He pleads not guilty. And the jury saw right through it, which would explain why they only deliberated for 10 minutes before rendering a guilty verdict. Bill Henderson is sentenced to 65 years in prison. The unknown DNA sample that had once seemed so important is never entered into evidence. We put James and, and Darren Laird's names and, and tested their DNA to the unknown strand and never came back to anyone else. Investigators suspect Melissa picked up the DNA from her day-to-day -day work as an EMT. You go to the store, you'd hear people talking about it, and, oh, hey, that's that, that girl, you know, that's that family. But no one knew at the time. E even her mom and dad was such denial at first that, you know, it was hard not to believe the rumors. With Melissa's murder, I can honestly say it's changed me in many ways. It's caused me not to be able to trust people. It's always second guessing on whether or not their intentions are good. Because if you can't trust your own family, who can you trust?